we are now covering the topic of capacitance. I use, yeah, I use OBS for everything. And I'm to record anything or I use it for streaming too. It's nice, it's free, you know, that's good. All right, so we're ready to start digging into the topics of circuits. So we're going to be developing this over several lectures. Um, today is focused on the topic of capacitance, which is related to a type of electrical component called a capacitor. Um, next week, we're going to be developing the ideas of current. And by the end of next week, we will have established Ohm's law. And then we can start looking at how to analyze circuits. So that's nice. Right? So the capacitance, okay, if we talk about a charge separation, okay, <clears throat> well, really, yeah, I mean, this is, this is a charge separation, okay? And this does not have to be limited entirely to, uh, entirely to capacitors, like paraplate capacitors. It can really be applied to anything, but we are going to primarily discuss it with respect to capacitors. The definition of capacitance, which is given by this capital letter C here, is a ratio of charge to potential difference. You can consider it <clears throat> as if you're given a potential difference, <clears throat> how much charge establishes that potential difference. So the word capacitance does have sort of this, I mean, it sounds similar to the word capacity, and in some sense that is true. Um, you could describe this as, you know, a capacitor um, with a given capacitance, how much charge can be stored per volt. And that's actually the units here, coulombs per volt. Capacitors are so endearing we love them so much that we've decided to give them their own unit, which we call the farad, named after Faraday. But for some reason, we don't want to call it the Faraday. We just want to call it the farad for I don't know why, but capital letter F. Now, <clears throat> just like when we deal with things in coulombs, we don't really typically deal with coulombs that are very large. We typically deal with things like micro, nano, maybe even pico for getting a little wild. Uh, the ferret is, is, is really the same sort of uh, thing here. We don't expect to have very large units of ferrets. That's not incredibly common. Um, typically, this kind of stuff we deal with is like micro is very large, micro ferret. Um, nano ferret is very common, pico ferret. Um, I don't think we go any any further down because it'd be what femno next we don't do a femno because that look weird that look weird right femno femno is that right i think i got that right i'm pretty sure i got that right the femno meter is apparently a type of thermometer too well that doesn't help whatever it doesn't matter we don't really go too much below that yeah, I can I never remember. We don't do things past Pico too much. Femno. What's after that? Addo, something like that. Yado. Yeah, whatever. Okay. Now. <clears throat> now, for any type of charge configuration that you could describe with a potential difference, the capacitance has this value of Q over delta uh, V. Like I said, though, we are going to primarily be looking at this with respect to parallel plate capacitors. So in that case, you have the following relationship here. For a parallel plate capacitor, the electric field is equal to the charge over epsilon naught A, right? Eta over epsilon naught. 
Q over A. Solving for Q here will be E times epsilon naught A, which would be the top here. And then on the bottom, we got to remember for uniform electric fields that the potential difference is equal to the electric field times the separation of plates. Hold on. You guys got to keep it down a little bit, if you don't mind. What? Keep it down a little bit, the kids. Oh, sorry. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so when we combine these together, the electric field drops out. And we end up with this quantity here, which is pretty darn cool because ultimately, while you have charge and potential difference here, ultimately, the strength of your electric field does not play a role in this. In fact, what this quantity is here are just a bunch of constants, really. I mean, you have your epsilon naught, and then your A and your D, they represent the, you know, the layout of the capacitor, or we call the geometric properties of it, just how large is it, how far are they spaced apart. And that's true of all kinds of capacitance, is ultimately it has to do with how the charges are configured. And there's nothing inherently um, based on electric field or voltage, because the Q and, and delta V both depend on that quantity, actually. But <clears throat> while that's true, and that's a nice thing to figure out, um, Typically, the relationship you see at the bottom here is the one we are going to be using, Q equals C delta V, okay? So, that's the relationship we're going to primarily see. However, in problems, if you are asked to solve something and you don't have the capacitance of something and you have information about how it's made, then you can use the above equation here to figure that out. And that's nice, right? That's nice. All right, so... <clears throat> um, this is kind of, uh, you know, if you remember what we talked about on Monday and how we finished up that discussion there, we had a simple battery and we had our, uh, you know, wires that just kind of were, didn't connect at the end there. Well, now what we're going to do here is attached to those wires, we're going to put our parallel plates. And right after you connect that capacitor, and that's the word I'm going to be using for now on here, the parallel plates here, I'm going to be referring to them as capacitors. What happens here is the minute you connect these, these will become charged, okay? It happens effectively instantaneously. Um, the motion of charge is pretty darn slow, to be honest. Um, but it very quickly creates a charge distribution on these things. And it we establish a delta V here. Now, assuming that there is no loss of, of voltage along the wires, if we call these ideal wires, which we'll deal with again later, uh, the voltage across the battery will have to match the voltage across the capacitor, uh, across this capacitor here. And if we have knowledge of what the value of the capacitance is, we can actually determine how much charge is located on the plates here. But the moment it's connected, we treat this as being effectively instantaneous. I mean, I actually will work it out, not today, but I think sometime next week, we actually work out how long it takes to charge the capacitor. And it's a ridiculously small number. I mean, it's so, it's, it's so small, it's, that it's, I don't know, it's just, it's a small number, put it that way. So now we have our capacitor fully charged here. Um, the battery has supplied that voltage there. Now these things are equal. And again, like I said, going from this page here to this page here, uh, this is effectively instantaneous. Now, and by the way, now we have an e electrostatic situation again. The stuff over here was tricky because you've been dealing with electrostatics. You haven't been dealing with current yet. So that can be a little tricky. All right. So question for you here. What is the capacitance of the two electrodes here? So you're given what the voltage is, you're given what their charges are. C's, C's, C's. I gotta tell you, 
I'm liking C quite a bit. And the reason why I like C, because it is the correct answer, the ratio of charge over potential. So this would be 4 over 2. This would be 2 nanofarads. Yeah, right. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. All right, simple enough, right? Just the definition of what capacitance is. Wait, professor? Yes. You said that it's Q over Q V. So do you take into account the negative charge or no? No. The idea is that when you have a situation like this, you have a separation of charge, and the separation of charge is equal amounts of charge, one positive, one negative. So the Q here is just what the charge is on one of the electrodes. We don't add it up or anything like that. We don't worry about the fact that one's negative. So, Thank you. Yeah. So capacitors um, are a very common electrical component. They serve a lot of different purposes. Um, by themselves, they store charge. And by store and charge, that means they can release charge and take on charge. So in a way, what they can do is they can, you know, they release energy. And, uh, you know, a lot of mechanical keyboards work by capacitors. You push a button down, you complete a circuit by doing that. That charges the capacitor, then it discharges it, and that is a signal to the computer that this particular button was pressed. Uh, the ones you see here, these, these ones typically that you see here, <clears throat> the plates are embedded in these. Uh, this is these uh, Some of these ones that are round are surrounded by an insulated material. Um, and a lot of times there's actually things inside of them. Like this larger one here, most likely this is a rolled up capacitor. Almost, almost definitely is. It could be cylindrical, but it's likely a rolled up capacitor. And um, sometimes there's material on the inside between the capacitor plates. And we'll get to that at the end here. They're called dielectrics. But they come in a lot of different forms here. Another thing you can do is when you combine capacitors with certain electrical elements, you can do additional things. For example, if you combine a capacitor with a resistor, you can create a, an element that is timed. You can actually control the length of time that current exists or something like that. And so it's it can be also useful to you know to create a time system. Um, you can create an oscillatory system as well um, if you combine it with say an inductor. Anyway, you'll see on we talk about different components here that you know the the there's a lot of usefulness to the individual components, but when they go in combinations with things, they can produce some pretty amazing things. I mean, heck, we're all using computers right now, right? Can't do that without a capacitor. Okay. All right. Computers are nice. They're not, though. All right. Two, three centimeter diameter aluminum electrodes of space, 0.5 millimeters apart. The electrodes are connected to a 100 volt battery. We want to know what the capacitance is and what the magnitude of the charge in each electrode is. Easy peasy. Let's get to it. Full screen, please. Thank you, Adobe. All right. Now. All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So, well, this, you know, we got this lovely thing here where we're given diameter and we don't want that. We're given centimeters. We don't want that. So make sure you put that into meters and you want to make sure you specify the radius. The capacitance, I'm going to work that out based on the geometric expression that involves the area and the plate separation because we don't have any other information here that helps us determine what the capacitance is. We don't know the charge. We'll have to get the charge later on. So I got my 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. Um, these are circular because they mentioned diameter here. These are circular electrodes, apparently. I Seems strange. Aluminum doesn't matter here. That might be different in the future, by the way. Um, we don't care about materials at the moment, but next week we will care about the materials. So for right now, that was just extra information. Aluminum shiny, so that's probably why they did that, because shiny, shiny pretty. And then the bottom, 
we have our plate separation. We've got to put that in meters as well. We end up with a 13 pico. It was 10 to the minus 12. So we got a picofarad here. Uh, apply that to the 100 volt, uh, 100 volts that the electrodes are charged to. We end up with the plates being charged at 1.3 nanocoulombs. So again, that means one is at a positive 1.3 and one is at a negative 1.3. Okay? And that's what we're looking at there. Pretty straightforward stuff. Let's keep chugging along. Okay. Now, single capacitors are fine. But what if you combine them? In a circuit, you combine multiple capacitors together, we can investigate what kind of behavior these things have when they're put in these configurations. So these are terms that you're going to start to see quite a bit of from here on out. The term parallel and the term series. Okay. And there's a lot of conceptual meanings to them. They have very special mathematical meanings to them. But the, what you see on the bottom left here is a configuration of a combination of capacitors in parallel. Now, I don't, really don't like the term parallel. I'll just tell you that. I don't like it because you look at this diagram and you're like, oh, yeah, look, the branches of this, these lines are parallel. Okay, well, that's not the only way it can be done. And that's not what parallel means because in a figure, things look like they're parallel. These two figures here, and we're not, we're not getting into circuit diagrams quite yet, so I have to explain a bit about what you're looking at right now here. This is the logical schematic of the, the, the circuit. It generally does not represent the physical configuration of the circuit. This is simplified to give you what the basic logic is, okay? The idea behind parallel capacitors, okay, is that all three of these capacitors are connected to this battery and they experience the full voltage of the battery. Let me show you. I'm gonna go to my lavender, because I like it. I wanna make it a little thicker though. I didn't like it, it was a little too thin before, honestly. Let's make it like that. Check this out. Oh, you can't see that so well. I'm not going to use lavender. Let's go with red instead. So I'm going to highlight the branches here. Everything I'm doing in red is all one continuous conductor. All the stuff in red right here. It's all touching the positive terminal of the battery. Let's say this battery was at a nine, was a nine volt battery. And everything at the top would be the exact same potential difference. It would be nine volts higher than whatever it is on the bottom. Okay, we don't know what's on the bottom. It could be zero, it doesn't have to be zero. Let's go with a, a, a darker blue for this one. On the bottom, we have also a continuous conductor down here. And really, this is what is meant when we say uh, 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 circuit components are in parallel. Okay. They all experience, that was an oddly patriotic diagram here, anyway. Um, they all experience the same potential difference um, here. It's almost like, think it is, I appreciate that. Um, it's almost as if these things are, se are, are, are connected, you know, separately from the battery. That's, in, in a way, that's kind of true. Um, now, how can you tell, though, if you have a parallel configuration? Because sometimes it's not, it won't always be drawn so nicely like this. Here's how you know. If you take a walk from the positive to the negative terminal of the battery, the question you have to ask yourself is, do I have options? Or am I forced to go a certain way? So for the parallel configuration, I have options here. I can go through C1, C2, or C3 to make my way to the negative terminal of the battery. Because I have options, that means these things are in parallel. Okay, Because there's options, it also means that they have the same potential difference across them. As opposed to the series configuration. Now let's draw that stuff there. 
the series configuration, okay, let's draw the red. Ooh, 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 ooh. I'll get my red here. So all this stuff up here is one continuous piece of conductor. And I'll do the blue again. That goes down here. But you notice now I don't have options anymore. I am forced to go through all three of these capacitors. And I'm going to throw in some other colors here. Here's a yellow for you. That's at a different voltage. And let's do hmm, green. That kind of goes, that's a little rainbow-ish. That's pretty. Very pretty, actually. I like that quite a bit, to be honest. Look, every place where there's a color difference, there's a different voltage. And so this is series, which is a nice term because series does imply a sequence, right? And so if I want to go from the positive to negative terminal of the battery, you are forced to go through all three capacitors. You don't have options. That means you have a series configuration. And what happens is, according to loop law, as you go around the circuit here, whatever the potential differences of the battery is shared among these. So if it's a nine volt battery, right, the nine volts would decrease across each capacitor here, depending on what their capacitance is. Say they're all the same. It would go three volts, three volts, three volts. So the red would be at nine, for example, a potential of nine. Let's say we're grounded here. So say we got a grounded, grounded thing here. So that when I say grounded, it means we know we're at a, you know, we're nowhere, we're at a, a potential of zero. So say we're grounded right here. So the top is nine, the yellow is six, the green is three, and then we get down to blue, which is zero. So um, that's the thing with series. Okay. It, again, if I grounded the parallel one here. The bottom would be at zero, and the, uh, the top would be at nine. Okay, any initial questions? I know I just kind of introduced that, and there wasn't a lot we developed so far, but is there anything unclear about what I'm talking about here? All right, so here we go with, uh, we're going to look at a, the simplest parallel configuration we can have, right? Simplest parallel configuration we could have are two capacitors in parallel. We'll, we'll call them different capacitors for the moment here, C1 and C2. Now, what we are interested in doing is these two capacitors are going to work together to produce an equivalent capacitance. So the idea is you can reduce these two down so that you can understand how they behave together as if they act as a single capacitor. And, um, and we call that CEQ or C equivalent. That's the idea. Okay. Now, <clears throat> in this example here, we know that these two capacitors, because they're in a parallel configuration, will have the exact same potential difference across them. So I'm not, we don't have a special label for the potentials. It's just delta V, delta V. For each of the capacitances that are here, these capacitors are going to store different amounts of charge on them, which I call Q1 and Q2. The equivalent capacitor is going to be the ratio of whatever that total charge is over the delta V. I can split that up into Q1 and Q2, and then I distribute the denominator among both of them, and we can see that this first term here This first term here, okay, is C1, and this term here is, is C2. <clears throat> now, they have to have the same amount of charge on them. Um, sorry, not saying we add up the amount of charge on them, because ultimately this potential difference establishes a charge there and a charge there. When you combine them together, they have to have the combined charge of those two things. That's an important element here. And so because of that, uh, we talk about this equivalent capacitance here. So the relationship is at the bottom. For a parallel configuration, your capacitances can simply add up. Let's go to the next. I think I have this on the next slide. Yeah, here we go. And it doesn't have, <coughs> excuse me, it doesn't have to be just two. It has to be, <clears throat> um, it could be a multiple ones multiple ones, and you simply add them up. 
So let me add something to the slide here. For the parallel configuration, <clears throat> we say here that the queues add up, you add up queues, and the delta V is the same. And that's what it means to be a parallel capacitor. <clears throat> you add up the charges among all the capacitors, all the delta Vs are the same. Because of that, the equivalent capacitance of the setup is simply the sum of their capacitances. Okay, so you wanna remember this little detail here. Qs are the same, sorry. Qs add up, delta V is the same. Okay, fantastic. What am I thinking of here? All right, anyway, let's move on. What is the equivalent capacitance of this capacitor? K, what? People, it's A, three plus six. You people with other letters in there, what are you thinking? I'm joking, I'm joking. What about a series configuration? The principle in a series configuration is that the voltages are now additive. And the charge on the capacitors are the same. So it's flipped here. When we had the parallel configuration, we had to add up the charges, and we know that the potential difference was the same. In the series configuration, things are flipped. Okay, if you look at, you know, having uh, a capacitance of C1 here, there is some potential difference that will occur there, uh, which you can determine from, well, I don't like to put it, that, well, yeah, I can put it that way, Q over C1 here. And that means there's a certain amount of charge that's established on this. Now, you have to have the same amount of charge established on the other one. If you did not have the same charge, the difference in charge would create its own potential difference and current would flow until things are equalized. That's how we know that the charges on these capacitors have to match up. If they did not match up, then you're creating an internal potential difference within the conductor, which... That's not what we're doing here. This, there's no, there's no uh, current here right now, right? So everything is still electrostatic, really. All right, so we know that for uh, uh, the series configuration, instead of the charges being additive, the voltages are additive. So I want to determine what an equivalent capacitor would be um, when we combine these two in series. Well... This is going to look a little funny here, but we're going to work out what 1 over C equivalent is. Okay, and you'll see why because of the math. Delta V over Q is what the definition is. You can split up the voltages. We can distribute the Q among the denominators. And then we see that individually these two pieces here are simply reciprocals of the capacitances. And now we end up with this pretty wild statement right here that the inverses if you add the inverses that is equal to the inverse or reciprocal I should say of the equivalent capacitance and that is true generally speaking you can add more capacitors if you like and ultimately you're taking a sum of reciprocals and then you take the reciprocal of that sum <clears throat> All right, now, something about this, just mathematically speaking, when you're dealing with this configuration right here, the simple concept of the math here is that your equivalent capacitor has the largest capacitance of, you know, it's, it, well, I'll say the equivalent capacitance is larger than any individual capacitance. Right. When it comes to a, series configuration like this, the nature of the math here is that your equivalent capacitance will always be less than any individual one. When you add inverses like this, your result, when you take the reciprocal of that, is always smaller than any individual capacitance. That just sort of helps as you're working on problems and you, know, you get an answer and maybe you have a bunch of capacitors that maybe it's like, I don't know, 10, 20, and then 50. And you solve the system and then you get an, a, a, an equivalent res, uh, capacitance of, say, 15. Well, that doesn't make sense. 
Okay, mathematically that's wrong. So you, you can automatically know that, okay, I did something wrong in the math here. So something just to keep in the back of your mind when you're doing problems. What is the equivalent capacitance of the setup here? You have a three microfarad and a six microfarad. Put the letter in the chat. Let me know what you think. You should be able to get this within a half second. Bam, half second, quarter of a second. If you haven't put a letter in chat in, it's bad. You should have got it immediately. 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 C's. Okay, remember one person was supposed to only was Oh my goodness. You guys are creating like DNA chains in the in the in the chat here. Got some A's, G's, C's. What the heck, man? This is not biology. Don't put throw T's in here. Oh my goodness. This is a lost cause. I'm logging out. That's it. I'm logging out. I can't make it any easier, people. All right, nope. What the heck? What is going on? All right, jeez. The answer is D. Now, how could you know this within a quarter of a second? Well, you can't because normal reaction time is longer than a quarter of a second. Let's go half second. You could do a quarter of a second, I suppose. Anyway, the idea here is that D is the only value that's smaller than any of the individual capacitances. This is, I mean, you can do the math here, right? One over three plus one over six, you flip that, you get a two out of it. But you can also rule out A, B, and C purely by the fact that their values either match these, which is a big no-no, or they're larger. That doesn't work. Yeah. There we go. Has to be less than this. Uh, well, it has to be less than any individual capacitor. Okay. So I could give you some crazy numbers here, right? I give you like, I don't know, 2.56, whatever, some telephone number, and the other one is some other number here. And if your only option, it, well, if one of your options is smaller, right, than either of them, well, that's it. You don't have to do the math there. Yeah, yeah no, I understood. I understood. I knew what you meant. I knew what you meant. All right, let's keep going. This. Oh, my goodness, what's going on here? Now, well, now it's getting a little wild. Right now we get a little wild because now we have three things here, and uh, we have a combination of parallel and uh, um, uh, series stuff. So how do you do this? Well, this involves the concept of nested combos. Nested combos. Here's what I mean by that. What we have here. <clears throat> is a configuration that contains a series. Uh-oh. This pen, I don't understand it sometimes. Well, look what we got in the middle here. This is, that's not a bad circle for me. Uh, this is a series configuration that is nested in a larger parallel configuration. So the parallel configuration is what I bought the circle is the nested series. And the way you have to solve this problem is you work in, you, you work at the innermost shell here, or nest or whatever you want to call it, and you work your way out. So the first step is to combine these two together. You combine these two together first. Now it's a series configuration. <laughs> it's a series configuration here. So I got to do my little equation, right? What's well, 1 over 20 plus 1 over 30. All right, so I solved my innermost one first. And I got it. And I, well, I didn't get it. You guys got 12. I took me a while to get there. I apologize. Um, 12 microfarads. So that means this picture can be reduced to the following picture you see down here. You got your battery. We replace the two here with the equivalent 12 microfarads. We have our 13 microfarads here. This is a, ser uh, a parallel configuration, which means we add them up and we get 25. 
and then this is our equivalent capacitance. These three act in tandem and they behave as if you have a single capacitor that is 25 microfarads. Fantastic. Um, now what we're gonna be doing a little bit later is once we establish this, if you're told what the voltage on the battery is, then you can go back through these pictures and you can work out how much charge and potential difference is on each of the elements. I think we do that a little later today. Let's get back to our stuff here. What are, ooh, this, is our, uh, well, this is what we're doing. What are the charge on and the potential difference across each of these capacitors? Let's do it. Now in order to do this problem, you have to, we don't have to, but that's why I'm gonna do it. I'm going to solve this as if it's an equivalent capacitor, right? One equivalent capacitor. So these are all in um, series here. So I gotta do my add up the inverses stuff. One over 12, one over four, one over six. That's a common denominator of 12, is it not? So I'm gonna do three plus two plus one, that's six, 12 over six is two. All right, I did it there, I did it. Two microfarads is the equivalent capacitance of these three. How much charge, therefore, would be, yeah, remember, if you have a series configuration, remember they all have the exact same charge on them. So I can use my capacity equation. I got two micro, make sure 10 to the minus six. I'm telling you, that's a micro, right? That's 10 to the minus six. People keep messing up that stuff. You see the micro, you put the nano in there, shake my head. Stop doing that. All right, 10 to the, oof, two times 10 to the minus six times 30, that's the voltage across uh, the single equivalent one, right? Because what this is here, this equation down here is for my single equivalent capacitor. The single equivalent capacitor has a voltage difference of 30 over because it's the only circuit element in there in the equivalent one. So we find that we have 60 microcoulombs on each of the capacitors. Each of the capacitors have 60. And then I apply the equations individually to them to figure out what the voltages are and check out what we got here. Okay, 60, 60, 60 over their respective capacitances. Notice that the smaller, okay, capacitance contains the highest potential difference. The 12 microfarads, have a five volt difference across them, okay? So again, this is a ratio, right? This is a ratio of charge to basically volts, right? Charge to volts. And, uh, and, and just to double check at the end of this all, when you add all these up, they should equal what the battery is, right? That's loop law. So if we have a gain of 30, over here, these are drops, by the way, right? Drop of five, drop of 15, drop of 10. We get back around, loop law is satisfied. Everything is fantastic, thumbs up. Now, what we wanna look into here, since we are storing charge on the capacitor plates, well, that can be released, right? You can release that charge. And so what we are implying here, it's not really much of an implication, but there is an associated energy that goes with this, right? Because what did potential difference come from ultimately? Potential difference ultimately came from our expressions of electric potential energy. So if we have a potential difference here, we can now talk about the amount of energy that is stored in a capacitor. So we go back to our original definition of what potential is, right? It's the ratio of energy per coulomb. It's joules per coulomb. So that's what we're gonna do here as well. I'm gonna consider a very small amount of charge that gets transferred over to the plates. It is going to provide a very small amount of potential energy. Um, and that will be established, right, by some potential difference that is set up by the battery, ultimately goes on the capacitor, right? Well, we have what delta V is for a capacitor, right? It's Q over C. So then if I integrate the expression up here, I can take the C out because it's a constant, and I'm gonna integrate this from zero to Q, where Q represents the full charge on the capacitor. 
So what we're doing here is we're really saying, let's take our charges and just one at a time, we add little pieces, and then we're adding little pieces of potential energy. And the integral allows us to just create that enormous sum and get a final value. And so if we do this, a very simple integral here, Q squared over uh, 2C. So that represents for us the total amount of electrical potential energy that is stored in the capacitor. It is a function of the amount of charge, right? And the capacitance. But there's another way to do it, right? There's another way to do it. Another way to do it is it, to not necessarily express it in terms of Q. Because remember, Q is not really the more practical side of this stuff. Uh, you know, Q is something we use for the derivation. But we really want to think about this stuff in terms of a potential difference because that is the more practical thing. So you just make the substitution using the capacitor equation. We get a one-half C delta V. And I like this more personally. This is my personal favorite of the two if I had to choose. Uh, I like this one uh, because I like potential. It's a lot more useful quantity. But both work just fine. Just a matter of what you know. I mean, and the equations are very simple to derive. All right. Okay, okay, okay. How are we doing here? You want to use the one... Well, here's the thing. The reason why you have two different equations is because you may be given two different... You may be given different quantities in the problem. I mean, what are you given? Are you given potential difference? You know, then use this. If you're given charge, use this. It's just a matter of what you have available to you. But they both work just fine. Okay. Fantastic. Under the sea. Under the sea. All right. Yes, my children were watching Little Mermaid. For some reason, in the AM. Disney movies should not go on the AM. Capacitor is charged at 1.5 volts. It stores 2 millijoules of energy. That's adorable. If the, char if the capacitor is charged down to 3 volts, what's happening here? Delta V squared. Delta V squared. This wasn't a trick. It wasn't a trick. Look, look. Right? If you double a potential difference, the amount of potential energy will go by a squared factor. We're not changing C, of course. So we go from 8, from 2 to 8. All right. Now, this is an interesting concept that we're going to we're going to tackle a little, we're gonna, I'm gonna mention it right now. Um, and then we're gonna look at this again later. This is a really interesting thing. We're gonna, we're gonna investigate this other quantity here. It's a lowercase u sub e. And this is what we call energy density. Now the capacitor has an electric field, right? Between the plates, fine. Um, that capacitor, you could say, um, in cases of volume, right? It's the area of the plates plus, and you consider the plate separation there, we create a, you know, at least in this example here, some rectangular volume. It doesn't have to be rectangular, it could be anything you like. The energy store is going to be given by UC. The volume is given by A times D, right? It's just a box. Then we start to throw in, you know, what these quantities are. What do we get here? Well, UC... Let's put this in terms of our, you know, the capacitance equation. Here we got a one-half C delta V squared divided by our AD here. Well, what was C, right? C was epsilon. Oh, come on. I'm going to have to draw it down here because PowerPoint is tripping right now. I'll just say that. Epsilon naught A over D uh, delta V squared all divided by A D. Now the A's drop out. You would get a D squared in here, by the way, if you move this D up here. But then when you combine it with the delta V over D, that's what electric field is, right? So this expression turns to this thing right here, which is pretty amazing, to be honest. The energy density. How much energy is stored in the volume that the capacitor defines is only related to the electric field strength. But it's actually the electric field strength squared. That's a weird thing, right? What I mean, 
electric field squared is a really strange quantity. So I'm just gonna like show this to you right here, It'll get you a little bit intrigued about what's going on here. In the back of your mind thinking, this is interesting. I'll, I'll, I'm gonna just store that in the back of my head here and I'll just worry about capacitors for now, but we'll revisit this later because this is very interesting because what this eventually is going to lead into is a statement about um, you know, what electric fields truly are because there was a debate um, you know, when, when modern physics started to become more and more developed because we have this concept of electric field, which for, for many physicists, you know, in classical physics, this was a, a mathematical construct. Until you start to see things like this, and you say, well, you know, what about this statement here tells me I have a capacitor? Nothing, there's nothing in this statement here that says I have a capacitor. What it seems to imply is if there is an electric field presence, there is going to be an energy density associated with that field. And so that it means that the electric field itself, just by existing, can store energy and impart energy. And that gives credence to the idea that electric fields are not just this imaginary quantity here. They actually represent something real. Okay, which we know now what's going on there. There are photons. And a big part of that is, is photons. And the fact that photons can store energy and all that stuff. So this is this is intriguing. This is intriguing. That's what I'll say. All right, so how are we doing on time here? We're good on time. I got 20 minutes left. Let me just see what my slides tell me is going on here. Example four. Oh, and then we got dielectrics. Excellent. We're doing good. And tabulous. Let's look at this example now. This is pretty straightforward stuff here too. So we got a 35 nanofarad and a 75 nanofarad capacitor are connected in parallel across a potential difference of 220 volts. So I drew that here, okay, 20 here. And so the idea is that in this figure, you got maybe your higher voltage there and your lower voltage right here. And we don't really care if there's a battery here. Maybe there's a battery. It doesn't really matter. Ultimately, we come in here, we branch off. We add options. I can go up to the 35. I can go down to the 75. And uh, if I combine these together into an equivalent resistance, right, because it's a parallel configuration, we simply add them up. And so this combo here acts as a single 110 nanofarad capacitor. All right. I want to find the total charge stored on the network, all right? So that would be, if I just work on this particular equivalent capacitance down here, is gonna be what the capacitance is times the voltage across it. And so this equivalent capacitance can store uh, 24.2 micro coulombs. Now I got everything here now. I have that the potential difference across the capacitor is 220. I have what the charge on it is. And now that I figured out about everything I need to know for this one down here, now I go back to the original configuration and I use the principles of series in parallel to figure out what the individual things are doing. For the top one here, I'm calling this Q1 up here. So that capacitance times the potential difference tells me that two point, uh, sorry, that 7.7 .7 microcoulombs are on the top one. And when I do the bottom one, I get 16.5 microcoulombs. Remember, in a parallel configuration, these things have the same potential difference across them, but their charges are additive. Now, I got the charges here, and I just need to confirm that they do add up and give me this number right here, and they do. So that's fantastic. Now, now I know everything about this stuff, right? I know for every single component, I know charge, potential, and capacitance for all of them. And this problem additionally want us to say some things about the energy in the network. So I'm gonna work out for each individual one, what that's gonna be. So I'm using the one half C delta V squared quantity, and I get 0.85 millijoules, 1.8 millijoules. I add that up, 2.7 millijoules. Guess what? If you work out what the energy is for the equivalent capacitance, you will get 2.7 millijoules. It makes sense, because look, the capacitances will add up, so the energies add up just fine. So there you go, nice problem. One additional topic here before we wrap this up for now. 
Um, at the moment here, right, we are dealing with a very simple capacitor. It's got a potential difference across them. We got a positive and negative plate. The region in between the capacitor plates matter, actually. And everything we described up to this point is running under the, under the assumption that the space between the capacitor plates is simply air, okay? You could fill this gap with other material. In fact, what typically happens is you can fill the gap in here with some sort of insulating material. That kind of material is what we refer to as a dielectric. Now, it has to be some sort of insulator, right? Because if it's a, if it's a conductor, well, you just create a short circuit for yourself and there's not gonna be any charge of the plates. All the charges are gonna be able to move through the conductor and reach the other plate. So it makes no sense to have a conductor. You have to have an insulator. What happens is when you do this, the potential difference across the capacitor plates now drop, they drop. So we use this notation here, the delta V sub zero, uh, and then just delta V by itself is an implication that there's a dielectric here. So you can see this when you see this notation together. Now the, the, the actual charge of the plates won't change at all, okay? But the potential does drop because the capacitance of the capacitor increases when you throw the dielectric in there. So why, right? But remember these things, voltage drops, capacitance goes up. Ultimately the charge does not change though. The charge does not change because the charge is maintained by whatever the potential difference is outside of dielectric, right? Okay, so let's look at more details here to figure out what's going on. What's this dielectric doing? Well, it's an, it's it's a, um, you know, the dielectric is an insulator, right? And being that it's an insulator, um, the capacitor produces an external electric field. Well, for any kind of substance, you know, especially for insulators, that will create a polarization. And whatever, you know, whatever the material is in there, the charges are gonna arrange themselves. So imagine there's little dipoles going on in there. They're gonna arrange themselves so that, you know, positives are going along the electric field direction and the negatives are going the other way. So what you're doing is by creating this configuration here, you have an electric field that points to the left. That's your external field. But what happens is when the polarization occurs, you are building up positive charge on one side and negative charge on the other side. And what that does is it creates an opposing electric field. We call this an induced field. Okay, on the left is what happens when we just have our uh, plates in air. Placing the dielectric between the plates produces a polarization in the uh, insulator, which produces a internal field inside the dielectric, which we call the induced field, okay? And um, what that does is it attempts to bring down the electric field strength. That's why the potential difference drops because the electric field becomes weaker when you put the dielectric in there. So that's kind of interesting. Now, the overall electric field is going to be the combination of the field when there's just a vacuum and the induced field. Now the induced field will always be opposite in direction. So when you add these quantities up, you end up with an electric field that is smaller. Okay, that's smaller here. So that's what's effectively good. Now, you might ask yourself, what, what are you doing? Why would you do this? This seems insane. Well, there's a few reasons why you'd wanna do this. One, we create capacitors that are generally very small things, especially when talking about computer comp components, right? So what is, you know, if we're looking at an electric field, where's my, a little notation here. So if we're thinking about what the is, right? The electric field is whatever the voltage is over this distance. But 
if you make computer elements, for example, with capacitors, and the distance between them is extremely small, you could actually end up with electric fields that are quite large. And you want to diminish those fields, okay? Um, and you could do that with by applying the dielectric in there. It produces a lower potential difference in a lower electric field. So it can be used to modify um, you know what the electric field strength is going to be in there. Because at some point, if it's too large, uh, there can be interactions with other equipment. I mean, if it's really large, you could actually have electrical breakdown of the air or whatever substance is in there. So that prevents that. Also, a lot of times the dielectric that is put there, it's not always like a slab. It's not like a, like a solid material. A lot of times they're a liquid. And you put the liquid in there, what happens is you can change the properties of the dielectric material by having things heat up or cool down. And in a way, you can create a somewhat variable capacitance as a result of that. So you can have, and this is a more complicated setup, but you can create variable capacitances. What's the date? Sorry. What's he doing? Somebody's out. There. Oh, it's the water people. I was like, some guy's just messing with my water meter right now, but it's the actual it's the water company. Never mind, they can mess with it. All right. So, how do we characterize this stuff? We characterize this stuff with kappa. Kappa is defined as a ratio of the electric field in a vacuum to the electric field with the dielectric. Now, this kappa, right, would be a value of one if we're considering the air. But in other situations, since the electric field will drop, kappa is normally a value that is larger than one. As you can see here, when you rearrange things with the capacitor equation, we see that our value for C correspondingly is also larger than the original based on whatever the capacitance is. So potential drops, electric field drops, capacitor goes up, all determined by kappa here. All right, I think I already said this. I did say this. Hmm. <laughs> I already said this stuff. Uh, what? Oh, uh, what? what? I got one more problem. I got one more problem. No more problem. What did I do? Let me just go to my school. Because this one's a little bit of a monster. A lot of words, right? A lot of words. Oh, let's let's get through here though. All right. We got a capacitor with a surface area of blank and plate separation blank. Got it. So right off the bat, that tells me what my capacitance is. And I worked it on part A here. C sub naught. Epsilon naught A over D. So this is my geom geometric definition of capacitance for a polar plate capacitor. And with a one, uh, 177 picofarads. The magnitude of charge on each plate. Oh, well, look at here. We're told that the plates are charged to 3,000 volts. So I use my capacitor equation with the capacitance I figured out, 3,000 volts, end up with a charge of 0.513 microcoulombs. All right, um, a sheet of insulated and plastic material is placed between the plates, completely filling the space between them. That's nice. The potential difference decreases to one kilovolt. So that means the potential went down by a factor of three. So the capacitor would, capacitance would go up by a factor of three. Remember, electric field potential will go down, capacitance goes up. So my capacitance here, I just worked it out with the values for Q and, and delta V, but I would know that if the potential went down by a factor of three, then this is gonna have to be up by a factor of three. That means kappa is three, easy enough. Now this is where it gets a little wild. We wanna know the magnitude of the induced charge on the face of the dielectric. Okay, so this is, this is a little complicated here. Magnitude of the induced charge. Well, in order to do that, we'd have to know what the induced field actually is. So the new field here is the electric field in air minus whatever the induced field is here. 
Well, I can change my new electric field using my kappa value, which is right here, and I'm going to solve for E induced. I'll just use E sub I here. So I got to do a little bit of mathematical gymnastics, and we eventually get down to an expression uh, that allows you to figure out what Q is. Because what I did here is I just took my electric field stuff, and this is these are capacitors, so I know what electric field of capacitors, right? It's Q over A epsilon naught. Um, the A's and epsilon naughts cancel out, and then I have my Q induced equals my uh, uh, charge on the capacitor. And uh, I have that value, right? It's uh, this microcoulomb value right here, and I have kappa is 3. So I work this out, and I can see, not surprisingly, that the induced charge is 0.354. That's double the 177. Okay, so this makes sense, right? Because if the capacitance goes up by a factor of three, well, then the original capacitance plus this additional amount here, they have to add up. They have to add up. So, uh, well, I'm sorry. I'm comparing the 0.53, I mean, to this one here. What else do we try to look for here? Uh, the original electric field between the plates, simple enough. We just put Q over epsilon. I didn't work out a value because that's pretty straightforward. The electric field after the dielectric is inserted, well, i got to figure out what E nu is. Well, I can use kappa to get that. A lot going on in this problem here. But um, as long as you just keep this in mind, the things that are really important about these relationships here are the following. I mean, you got to obviously know what your capacitor equation is. And you got to realize that how dielectrics work and how dielectrics work really is all governed by this statement right here. The new electric field is what it is in a vacuum minus the induced field. And once you remember that and all the other little equations, you can get through. This is a really nice problem. I really like this problem. It's a great problem, actually. I'm very, very fond of this problem. All right, best buds. Best buds, me in example five. Best buds. 